day two of DPLA Fest. Um, I really enjoyed being up at Library Congress yesterday. I mean, the, the, the setup and the ambiance was amazing, but also the content was great. Um, and just the, the session that really jumped out to me was the session in which we were talking a lot about the Library Congress and Smithsonian and the National Archives collaborating on a big project. Um, and so today is really just a drill down on, on more of the kind of the underlying work that we were doing uh, on the World War I, uh, National World War I app. Um, and I'm, I'm glad that you guys came to, to hear this. We've got a, a great group of speakers today. Um, so three years ago, we had the idea that we wanted to digitize World War I and World War II film and photo and bring that to the public. Um, kind of a standard idea at this point. Um, but what we added to that was a community engagement and a uh, community building portion of the project. And then along with that, we also uh, added a, an app as a kind of a specific technological way to reach out to the communities that we were engaging with and that we were building. Um, and so for those three parts of the project, we have uh, speakers as part of our team. Uh, you're gonna have Chris Kovac, who will speak right after me, and she's gonna talk about the preservation and the digitization of the World War I films, which um, are, I think, unique in the world to the collection that we have. Uh, then we're gonna have Carrie Young from uh, History Pin come up and talk about the community engagement and the community building work that we did and, and kind of how that uh, fits into the project. And finally, we're gonna have uh, Brandon Knowlton, uh, also from History Pin, uh, talk to us about kind of the design thinking that we included in the building of the app. So I'll get out of the way and turn it over to the people who know what they're doing. Hi, I'm Chris Kovac. Um, the first thing I'm gonna show you is actually a promo that we put together for the project. And while this panel is mainly focusing on the World War I content, when we initially started the project, it was for both World War I and World War II. So you'll see um, both here. I know most people think that Library of, the Congre Library of Congress has all of the film, but the archives actually has the second largest collection in America. And we have the largest collection of World War I material. So I'll play this really quick, and then I'll tell you a little bit about what we do. Picture Preservation Lab, we are um, both doing preservation and digitization. We are one of the last fully photochemical labs in the country. There's less than a dozen for sure and getting fewer and fewer every day. So what does this mean? That means we actually are inspecting and repairing the actual film and then we are making new film copies of anything that is experiencing deterioration. So as part of this project, it's allowed us to focus on preservation of these particular <coughs> materials. So to do this, we've got a wide range of equipment. We've got printers from the 1930s that are still functional, as well as more modern printers. Um, and then we've got our digitization equipment. And for this project, we're scanning in to HD, so 1920 by 1080. We're creating AVI master files, and then we're creating um, MP4 derivatives in different bit rates depending on where the content is going. Um, and then for a couple select titles, we're also doing full-blown restoration. So we've got a 4K scanner that we're using for that, and we're using digital vision to do the um, color correction, dust busting, and remastering of the films. And, um, the main one that we've done so far for the project is The True Glory, which you saw a, a brief clip of that. And that was actually an Oscar award winning film that was created in conjunction with um, US and British forces. So a little bit about the World War I collection. Um, we do, as I mentioned, have the largest World War I collection in the US. And in 1939, two million feet came to us. It was donated by the War Department, the US Signal Corps. And it covers both training activities on the home front as well as um, actions that were happening primarily in France, but other countries as well. Um, the, I'm gonna skip down to the third one. Um, CBS used a lot of that footage for the 50th anniversary um, in 1960. <coughs> Seven. <laughs> um, 
And so we actually have a lot of duplicate material between 111H and 111CBS, but they actually have quite a bit of material from Italy as well that we are able to acquire. Um, the Ford Motor Company donated their collection to us in the 1970s. And this collection is particularly of interest because it covers a lot of the home front activities. So people growing their victory gardens, Liberty Loan drives, those sorts of, sorts of things. And then um, the last item there would be Durboro nitrate. This is kind of interesting and we were actually able to partner with the Library of Congress to preserve this full, um, full 13 reel film. It was shot by a Chicago camera, news cameraman and he was actually paid by the German government to go over and shoot the war from the German perspective. Um, and the Library of Congress did a full restoration this past summer and screened it at the Pordenone Silent Film Festival and used um, footage that we actually scanned as part of this project to insert into the restoration to make it complete. Uh, I actually just went over all this. <laughs> um, so to talk a bit about more about the project, um, we received the funding for the project um, I guess at this point it's been a little over two years ago when we started in um, on scanning the content. And we focused on World War II to begin with and then we, with the 100th anniversary coming up, we quickly transitioned to um, focusing more on World War I. So we're scanning the entire 111H collection which consists of um, almost 900 individual reels of content. Um, as of the beginning of this month, um, we've completed 28% of the collection, um, and that's about 106 titles or 254 reels. And um, I'll just sort of briefly mention the photographs because that is an important component of this project as well. And so far, 22,000 of 75,000 photographs have been scanned, and I believe um, almost all of them are available in the National Archives catalog at this point. As um, sort of an added value to the project, in addition to just scanning the films, we have also um, embarked on scanning all of these index cards and descriptive shot list sheets. And those are also being paired up into the catalog with the film. Um, and uh, that's, that's ongoing. But you can see we have all of these handwritten shot lists. The, the cards are typed, and then we also have typed shot lists, but all of that material is being added as well. In order to make the content accessible, we're doing a handful of different things. So we're uploading all of the files into YouTube, and we've created a playlist there that contains all of the World War I and World War II content. And at this point, I believe there's 157 titles available there now. Um, the public can also access all of the video content through um, a site called Amara, and that allows the public to tag and transcribe uh, the content that's there. And this has been really exciting and really useful. I believe, and maybe Marcus, you have the exact number of languages, but I think it's been, different content has been transcribed in up to like 15 different languages. Um, and then, uh, we're also providing content to um, the folks at History Pin who will tell you more about the app that they're, they're creating. Um, so that's sort of my piece, very brief in a nutshell, and you can learn sort of more about um, what we're doing and how we do it. Um, we've got a video that kind of goes over everything that happens within the lab, and then um, We've got our Twitter handle, and then we also have a blog called The Unwritten Record where we routinely um, put content there. And um, one post that might be particularly of interest um, for the World War I program is, um, there was that little bit in there where you saw like the guns moving in tandem. Um, that's from World War I, and that was an early sound sort of anti-aircraft system. So in order to, in, in addition to um, just putting the content up there, if something grabs us that looks unique or interesting, we'll also kind of go that extra mile to find out about the technology and what's going on within the, within the content. So with that, I'll turn it over to Carrie. Oh, thanks, 
Chris? So hi everyone, I'm Carrie. Um, I'm with History Pin, and as Marcus mentioned, um, uh, we were brought on board to help uh, run an evalu uh, evaluation strategy and engagement strategy to complement all of the great digitization work that Chris and um, others at NARA are doing as part of this project. Uh, so, and for my part, I've been working with our internal and external audiences as well to help develop and execute our engagement on the ground. Uh, so this project has been a fantastic opportunity to really take a design approach to engagement uh, and to really think about how we can build the culture of reuse at NARA. So we know that NARA reaches certain audiences like teachers uh, who use their fantastic docs teach uh, education <laughs> materials to also researchers who visit the research room but beyond that, it wasn't entirely clear who was engaging with our content. So this project has been a really great opportunity to really experiment and take this re uh, research further. Um, and NARA has been great in really helping us approach uh, engagement and, and evaluation uh, in a way that really hasn't been seen before at the archives, which is really exciting. Sorry about that. Um, so a big part of this has been designing an evaluation framework uh, that we can use to measure our activities and outcomes over the course of the project. Um, and this is what we largely focused on for the first nine months, I would say. Uh, so through a series of interviews and literature reviews and also case studies, uh, we summarized nine key communities of interest and also developed user personas to get a, um, a better understanding of the motivations as well as the challenges to utilizing the wartime films. Um, and so we started with our potential audiences. We did a lot of internal interviews with folks like Chris um, and with Meredith back there, I see, um, to really get a sense of who's currently engaging with their content um, and what their current levels of engagement might be. Um, and we also looked in, in particular at which groups might be magnifiers for engaged learning or community hubs in of themselves, because we thought that this was a really important bit uh, to focus on. Uh, so with this graph, for example, uh, what we eventually want to see is all the groups that we're engaging with kind of moving to that upper right-hand quadrant of the graph so that higher levels of engagement are marrying with higher impact levels too. So part of making this happen, eventually, um, has been working with NARA to really get a sense of what full engagement might look like, uh, to be able to prioritize certain groups uh, in engagement, um, and looking at what the ideal scenarios might be for these different groups using the wartime films. Uh, so and while there are groups on the kind of the periphery of this graph who are not currently engaging with, we do have them here because we see the potential for engaging with them kind of moving forward. Uh, and we do want to stress that our approach is an iterative, uh, it's an iterative approach. We see, we really see the value in refining and refining in order to make our engagement strategy better, but that we are being systematic uh, about kind of building upon all the research that we are gathering along the way. So we looked at case studies uh, as a way to get inspired by some of the fun ways uh, others are engaging their communities, not only with film, but uh, their use of branding, their use of resources, and other kinds of elements that uh, can help inspire us and give us ideas for how to design certain products that engage specific audiences. Uh, so on the left there, for example, there's the duo of Men in Blazers, who are Michael and Roger, um, and they have an NBC sports show where they're basically engaging American audiences on the very niche topic of soccer. <laughs> Uh, or American football uh, by using a specific type of reporting. Uh, so in short, they're hilarious. Um, but the point is that they're taking a really niche topic and making it really engaging um, by a, you know, engaging folks in a specific way, by reporting in a certain way. Um, 
And then on the right, there is Community Cinema, for example, which is a PBS independent lens program uh, that shows documentary films. Um, and we really liked how they were utilizing content experts in their programs. Uh, they had a nice mix of online and offline engagement. Um, and they were seeing their audiences diversify as their topics were changing. So these are just a few of the, the wide range of examples we were looking at in the beginning to really help inspire us and build our evaluation framework. And so from our original list of nine audiences, we eventually narrowed it down to three specific audiences that we'll be focusing on within the next year or so, uh, particularly with the World War I engagement that we'll be doing. Um, and they are teachers, particularly the uh, middle school and high school level, and museums of varying sizes nationwide, and also coders and digital humanists. Uh, so kind of in addition to representing different levels of risk and return based on existing narrow experiences and resources. Uh, we also, um, for example, with teachers being really highly engaged at NARA to coders being a group that NARA would like to engage with a lot more, um, these groups also <laughs> kind of presented the most opportunity for reaching, you know, amplifying community um, and for helping us reach new audiences. And. So while there will be some overlap with some of our original nine audiences, uh, we hope that taking our experiences engaging these groups in particular, that we can kind of take, these, take those experiences and apply it to different subject areas moving forward. So building on all of these initial measurement frameworks, uh, in the past year we've been designing with NARA ways in which we can continue to measure engagement with these groups really taking a hard look at the outcomes we want for this project, um, the activities that might help accomplish these outcomes, and also specific measurements for these activities. Uh, and amazingly, so NARA has been able to support a product that supports all of, the, all of these measurements that we want to be doing. Uh, and that's what we hope will become the National World War I app that Brenda and will talk a little bit more about in a bit. And for my bit, I've been working a lot with representatives from our three groups uh, to enlist contributions for the app and the history pin collection that we're seeding NARA content on, and really just helping to connect all of the great um, films that Chris is working with and all the photo metadata, uh, connecting that with existing community projects, which has been lots of fun. Um, and as Chris mentioned, we'll eventually also, in addition to all the great films, have up to 100,000 World War I images to work with, uh, like this awesome one as part of a Women in World War I collection that uh, Kristen D'Anfrazio from the Still Image Unit helped us to curate. Uh, so I'm, I'm imagining like all the great um, things we can continue to map, all the data we can parse, um, the collections we can curate as we're moving forward. Um, and we want to make sure that we're uh, really involving these internal experts um, as much as we can, members of our three audience groups moving forward, uh, to really bring them in as a part of the design process um, and making sure they're helping us build out this content. And so we've made our findings publicly available. Um, I don't have it with me, it's over there. But we produced a document um, that will uh, go into a lot more detail than I have. Uh, so if you're interested in learning more, please see me. And also if you're interested in beta testing or um, data mining or any other kinds of projects that you think will connect well with ours, just come see me. And with that, I'll turn it over to Brendan. Thanks, Carrie. Good morning. Uh, can you all hear me fairly well? OK. Right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, kind of taking away the cover just a little bit uh, and kind of show a little bit of the internals of, of trying to run a design process, uh, knowing that we had a goal in mind, but then we weren't quite sure how to get there and some of the steps we took along the way. Um, I've, uh, I've labeled my slide 7th of April because that's when I had to hand it in, so I didn't get to actually work on it last night like I usually would at conferences, so I feel very, very virtuous and I just kind of want to get points for that. Um, okay, anyway. So 
our, we had an idea already as to what we were going to uh, start with. We knew that we had these brilliant films. They were being digitized, never before seen. Um, access generally only through research rooms, very, very difficult to see how that would connect to the wider world. And then we also had the opportunity of this partnership, um, which seemed to be uh, something that we certainly hadn't uh, worked with or seen uh, very much before, but because of the centenary, it was this great opportunity to bring together uh, world-class institutions. And so we thought that mixing up what the National Archive, what the library had, what the Smithsonian had, uh, we could really create something that would be a collaborative tool for these groups that Carrie's been talking about. And when we were thinking about uh, what we would build for teachers, what we would build for people in local museums, what we heard was that, of course, there are lots of textbooks out there. There are lots of broadcast channels out there. There are lots of ways for a single person to express a single thesis about the war and use primary source material to do it. But what we thought we had the opportunity to do here was to actually create a tool that would help to enable an actual give and take, a real collaboration uh, in which the teachers and the local museums were able to uh, have a, a very strong impact on the product that we came up with. So starting with that idea, you know, we could have just kind of gotten into coding. We know that we've got, you know, APIs, we know we've got access to data, we know the platforms we're using, but one thing that, uh, that we generally believe is that uh, if you don't have, you know, requirements or design, then, you know, the programming of something would really just be, you know, adding bugs to something that's an empty text file. It doesn't do something that, uh, that necessarily meets the needs of users until you actually understand what those things are. So we had to go through a process of trying to understand what sort of requirements we had here and what the designs could be that could actually reflect that. So we did you know, what you really have to do. We sat down. We sat down around tables, lots of times with lots of people. Uh, we had a lot of people give us feedback uh, about, yes, there's a little cameo from several of people in the audience here. The, we asked about what you would need, how you would engage, how could you use something in a classroom setting, how could you use something in a local museum setting, what would be, what's a simple enough task to fit into the way World War I is taught uh, in American high schools. They're, these are not long units. These are not graduate seminars where you get to develop a thesis over a period of many, many months. These are short modules. Uh, you need to be able to do a certain amount of preparation of things in advance, and yet you still want that to be meaningful for the students. So we did a lot of uh, asking about the end use and tried to kind of play with that and brainstorm that and come up with some ideas. At the same time, we had to get into the collections because this is about content. It's about understanding how a particular kind of connection uh, could be made between content and audience and how a new kind of audience could be developed. And so we needed to understand a lot about the structure. And this is something that we've seen um, as being you know, really a key point with other uh, digital projects that we've worked on uh, at very large scale, both here in the US and in Europe, um, that if you're building generic platforms, you know, if you're building uh, something that is just kind of a, a way of pushing content out there, but you're not really thinking about the content itself, the shape of the content, the length of the content, the size of the content, then, you, then the best you can get is a sort of lowest common denominator, and you end up with, uh, with you know, no offense to any institutions represented here, you end up with a single search box with a keyword in it. And that's the, that's the entry point to the entire collection, is simply a keyword search, at, at, and you're kind of asking your user to already know what they're going to see. You're asking your user to already have this idea in their head of what they're going to experience by typing in some magic word into your one keyword search box and ending up in the middle of all of this beautiful material. But you know that there's material on one side, but your users don't. And so we needed to really understand what the content was that we could see how to put it into an actual workflow, how to put it in front of people at the right points in time. So from, of course, uh, we have uh, generated a lot of post-its. We have generated a lot of ideas. We've gotten a lot of ideas from people about how this could work. We thought about, um, we thought about a lot of the traditional ideas, like, like keyword search, but also started to pull through into the idea of how can you gather collections together? How can you use them in a way to actually tell a story? What is the thing that we want teachers to, to, to know and for their classes to know, the thing that we want local museums to do has a lot to do with understanding historical documents. It's a lot to do with how to construct a thesis and how to find documents that go with that thesis that help to show how something is or how it could be. And so we started to get to what we thought some goals really could be uh, for this application and, and what the program 
of work and instruction around it could be. And of course, we want to promote the discovery and use of the, of the collections. A multi-channel approach makes sense here, pushing things to YouTube, pushing things to Amara, pushing things through the app, having things in the NARA catalog. Discovery is enabled through all sorts of things, and it's great to be able to have that sort of digital scale of being able to push things in multiple ways. But at the same time, we really wanted to try to enrich the collections themselves. We thought there might be an opportunity uh, to use tagging and segmenting, really recontextualizing the collections themselves, finding ways in which it fit with a local lens, with a personal lens, with a family lens, with a military unit lens. There are lots of ways where you can make the collections themselves more valuable simply through the engagement process. And through that, we thought that we could pull that into a process of actual community building, really try to find ways that communities could frame and answer these historical questions that had local relevance, that had local meaning. So that's what we've been trying to do. At the same time, looking at the content, we needed to try to think about the more of the emotional tone of what we wanted to get. What was the idea of what people should kind of know and feel and do? For that, we really started with uh, the content itself. Looking at the films, we had this great visual inspiration to start with. We have all of this beautiful typography. We have all these beautiful uh, you know, tonal palette to work with. We have uh, black and white photography mostly from this period, and of course the films are mostly predating sound films. So we had an idea of the sort of content that we'd be presenting. And we also knew that there would be uh, a context for use that we thought would really make sense. And after trying with a few things, we did come up with an actual app, the idea of something actually working you know, on an actual device. This seemed to be something that would uh, work for us with the idea of the sort of the tangibility, making something feel as real as possible, almost being able to reach out and touch content and work with films, work with, work with images. This, and while we wanted to start with that idea and make sure that what we built could work offline in a classroom to make sure it could work offline in a museum kiosk, actually work on a tablet. We also want to make sure that there's a web version of all of this as well so that we can in include all the different categories of use where we see things. And tablets may be popular in the classroom, but they're certainly not the only way that people are experiencing content. And so knowing a little bit about the target, we just kind of started sketching like you always do uh, with these sorts of projects. I think this, was, uh, this wasn't even our first idea. This was you know, five or six version of, ev of evolution. We just kind of kept simplifying, kept getting down to this idea of if you actually were in an archive, if you could pull films off the shelves and work with them with your hands, what would it actually kind of feel like? Would it actually feel like kind of a reel of things that you're actually working with? Could you just kind of keep pushing and moving and actually moving things together, gathering them together, could you start to feel like this was, this was an idea of working with content? And so we don't have a lot of menus. We don't have a lot of browse points. We don't have a lot of keyword searching, although it's still there. But what we decided to do is to really focus on the experience of the content itself, make each piece of content a jumping off point for the next piece. And so just like with every design process, you start to get a little bit more accurate. You start thinking about specific functionality. You start designing. You start wireframing. You start checking with users. Uh, even at this point, we started to find uh, that there were early ideas we had that were simply too complicated for some of our audiences to grasp quickly. We had to simplify again, even at the wireframe stage. And then starting with our look and feel exploration, we started to think about what the app could actually feel like. How would you present a map in this context where you're talking about the World War? How would you present a photograph? What sort of type would you use? We found some font faces from the 20s that fit really well with the title cards of the films that we were going to be seeing. Uh, we found some web fonts that were very readable and still suggested um, a little bit of a hearkening back to the past, but also would be modern and clear and work on, on a variety of devices. So this was something that we wanted to take and continue to iterate and think about where content would work in, in this thing. And so we ended up with a design that started to feel a little bit like this, where you're starting to put content front and center. You're starting to make media as, as, as obvious as possible. It's a media presentation app. We want the media to be very clear. We want to keep the metadata blocks from the institutions who are providing it, but we want to make sure that as much as, as possible can actually be navigated. We want to use those tags. We want to use those ways of connecting things to actually create something that's real. So 
we start to get down to a little bit how we would bring it together. In some ways, the technology was straightforward because we had so much that we could pick up. There was a lot off the shelf that we could just kind of use. I would actually say that, you know, as incredibly proud as I am of our development team, of, of the work that they've done so far, I am also, you know, kind of very aware that there's a lot that they could start with that was already working. And for us, the secret here has really been APIs. It's really been application programming interfaces, ways for computers to talk to computers about data. It's very straightforward. History Pin now has an API. NARA has an API. DPLA has an API. Library of Congress is kind of going a little bit that direction with data dumps, and Smithsonian says their API will be here any day now. Um, well, it's obviously something that's very much in the pipeline and is going to be usable soon. But our thought here was to really use as many of these building blocks as we could uh, to build the technology behind the app. And this is kind of the way it ended up working. We ended up, because we needed to stage content, because we found that users found the whole reel was actually too hard to work with. We needed to do segments. We needed actual kind of intellectual scenes within films to work with. So we needed to stage that somewhere and work with it. We found that the tags needed to be fairly consistent. So we had a bit of a content curation task to do as well, and still do. This is going to occupy a lot of our summer. We're going to be really in the weeds on this for a while. Um, but, they, but by using APIs and data dumps to pull from the Nar National Archive collections, from the library collections, from Smithsonian, staging them into historypin.org, a platform that's designed for kind of gathering and sharing uh, cultural heritage content. We worked with uh, musea, museums, museums.eu, uh, who has a virtual exhibition platform, which worked really well for holding uh, some of our uh, user-generated user stories within this, connected to History Pin via APIs. Use the APIs live to feed the actual wartime films app. You have the app itself just look at APIs live against these actual data stores so that we didn't have to hard code a lot. We didn't have to put a lot into the app itself. We didn't have to download hundreds and hundreds of megabytes of material in order to distribute this. Instead, we can just le read things live. And then using the API on the other side to push tags and annotations back into, NARA's annota back into NARA's own infrastructure. All of these APIs are what enable us to actually make this app work and do it fast and do it accurately and do it in a way where the content really has primacy because we're not making lots of copies of things. We're doing as much reading in real time as we can get away with. So this is where we get to the idea of the functionality for the app. And I can give you just a very quick preview today uh, because we're kind of in a sort of alpha mode. We're in, a, we're in a very controlled mode where we're trying to start to work with people to kind of examine our ideas, uh, help to question our assumptions, help us to refine the next stages of building this. But I can show you a little bit of what it looks like. And everyone in this room, you're definitely the first ones uh, to see it, except for a couple of our very close friends at NARA. Um, so as I said, we'll keep the, uh, the app will be mirroring, mirroring content that's staged uh, in a particular area on historypin.org, uh, which is being staged in real time. And then we pull from that into this much more uh, spe specific environment. So we can use History Pin to do things like get people to help us geolocate things or help, help us to add tags to things, even help us to look at the segments that we have for films and whether they're the right length. But then we can use the app for what it's best at and really focus not on a general navigation case, but on something that's much more based on content and tags. So I can show you, I have an actual app running on an actual iPad, which I can now show you, with the idea being that People are working with collections that have been put together. And this is great. I, get, I love doing alphas in front of large audiences because things work, and then they don't, and it's beautiful. But this idea, I'm sorry? Sign is in the way. Even better. OK, so now you can see tiny little bits, and I can't, although I did bring my very biggest iPad just to make sure. The, the idea of starting with particular collections that people have put together and being able to use this sort of interface to just kind of work through things and play with them, or even you know, kind of have that direct experience of how these films could be experienced. This was something that we wanted to be really as close to the, the, the heart of the application as possible. We wanted to rely on the app as being the way to really pull these films together. Um, the idea that was, though, that you could kind of start with, pr that you could start with uh, some of these films, use those jumping off points, use tags to navigate a lot of what we're creating to find other collections that use those similar tags. And then from there, you can start figuring out what you want to do with that. And so each experience ends up being quite consistent, but it's a mix of things that are pre-selected and curated versus things that get created kind of on the fly. And so each of these things 
And by the way, I think that uh, if you haven't actually uh, looked at Nara's collection of people playing baseball while wearing gas masks, you really should because it's really fun. Uh, and I really think that more people will be playing baseball with, ba with gas masks in the future. But uh, this, this idea of being able to just kind of navigate through a collection, find the things you want, is great. But for us, the, the most interesting point is that any piece of content that you're at within this app, you can immediately add to your own collection. You can immediately add to some other thing that you've created. And so, you know, we've taken this idea of user collections and started to turn that into something where it feels almost like an institutional collection, but is really starting to be a short story in and of itself. So we start with the idea that, that we have tags to navigate through. We have some slightly more curated things like feature tags. We use some of those docs teach categories, some of these educational resources that NARA has developed to find the themes where we can actually write a little bit more about things, where we can find ways to pull people into particular journeys. But then, just as importantly in the interface, the idea that our users, our teachers and their classes can create their own historical questions and answer them. They can create these little collections. They can be surfaced within the app. They can be shared. They can be seen through social networks. They can be seen on the web. Um, users and organization can really create these little collections with just a couple of clicks. We, the idea of this is really to give a voice to our users. And we took, for example, the Women in World War I collection that Kristen had created from, uh, the, na from the National Archive. We took you know, a minute or two and started, to, and started to use our app to create a couple of basic chapters, to start putting in some content that seemed to really relate to that, to start trying to tell that story in a, in a simple way, but one that, you know, with just a couple of captions and a couple of chapters, suddenly you've pulled together, you know, 10 items of content and you've got a way of actually talking about something around history. And then the process of being able to edit that, you can always do that with one click. You've got the material in front of it, you just start typing away, you start changing things, you start adding other content, you start searching for it. It's something that, that we think can be very, very straightforward. For us, this potentially could be uh, something that's very, very interesting. And the next thing I'd really like to do is to start combining the use of institutional content with what users might have in front of them. There's no reason that we can't you know, add based on a search or add based on your other collections, but you could also add based on taking a picture of something right in front of you, taking a picture of an object in a museum, taking a, a quick scan of a photograph, just using the camera on a device, or using even the webcam on a, on a laptop, you can get a pretty good sense of what an image would be. And some of that material can be mixed up with the institutional content, which already is coming from so many of these different places and will grow over time until you're really able to express these stories and share them in a very special way and something that wouldn't be possible through any single one of these institutions. It really relies on that sort of cooperation and that sort of working together. So we're at an alpha stage. We have some things working. Some things are working really, really well. But we have a lot to do. We are going to be scheduling some discussions with teachers, of course. We need to be scheduling discussions with local museums, of course. We need to check these assumptions and make sure that we're in a good shape. We are going to be doing a lot of content. We have a lot of films to segment. We have a lot of tags to look at. We have a lot of photographs to look at. We have to look at, you know, can, you know, are there good solutions for automatically cropping, you know, thousands and thousands of images? Uh, you know, if so, that'll save us some time. I think we, we have still a couple of technical challenges, but also a lot of just kind of old-fashioned labor to put in over the summer uh, as we get this going. But we'll really be recruiting people to test the beta version. So I hope that you'll all, I'm looking around for signs of attention and interest. Yes, looks like everyone is interested in actually helping us to test this once we have a little bit more going. So we'll tell you over the summer uh, how you can help us get some more information. And yes, 1.0 will be coming. We should see this in time uh, for the school year to start this year so that we can really uh, be building up in curricula over the next school year, leading up to the centenary of the kind of declaration of, of war uh, in April of 17, uh, really leading up to boots on the ground in Europe, uh, kind of early 18. I think over this whole period of time of emphasizing home front and training and how this material works together, we'll be producing some absolutely fantastic results in classrooms and museums around the US. And now with some interest from some of our European partners, it looks like we may have some help from Europeana and from Europe and from EuroCLEO, the Association of European History Educators, to help us take some of this content abroad as well and start finding ways to maybe even mix that up with collections that come from places like Deutsche Kinematek, which has some brilliant collections of newsreel footage from the same era. 
So that's what we're doing. Uh, a big thank you from everyone on the history team and everyone else at NARA. Um, we're just absolutely loving this project and can't wait to show you what's coming next. Thank you very much. Oh, no, we're fine. So that took us right to the end of the time. Um, I appreciate everybody coming. We're gonna, we'll stay in this space for about another 15 minutes, so I wanna release whoever needs to move on to the next presentation, but um, definitely come on up and talk with us. We would love to get your impressions and uh, hopefully work with your institutions in the future. So thank you for your time. Thank you.